G'day guys, back with the Our Circle. As you'd know, I did the Road to Thramus Part 7 video. And within that video, uh, I didn't go into the two characters they dropped in the little tacked on rules section. The reason I did this is because the video was already getting quite long. I was I spent like a half an hour almost just talking about the Road to Thramus Part 7 and what was in the main section of the article as well as the extra five or six minutes on Chinzar. So rather than muddy it all up, I want to do a separate video on these two characters and use it as a bit of a learning point for how I think about characters uh, when I first look at their rules and why I think a certain way about it. And hopefully people will understand where I'm coming from and maybe you can use it as a lesson to yourself when writing rules or maybe you think I'm full of shit and you can just ignore me. Either way though, let's read on because I've only quickly glimpsed through the rules. I haven't done a full breakdown of them yet. But I knew I would and I didn't want to tack it into the same video. So, Farith Red Loss, 200 points, weapon skill 6, normal for a Praetor, ballistic skill 6, high for a Praetor, strength 4, toughness 4, 3 wounds, initiative 5, attacks 4, leadership 10, save 2+. plus. So all that across the board is very normal for a Praetor. His uh, unit type is infantry, his war gear is the Dreadbringer's Plate, a Mastercrafted Power Axe, which is a very underwhelming weapon for a uh, a Dark Angels character or a Praetor in general. Um, it's important that it's an axe because there are no bonuses to fighting with axes, even though a, they're a traditional knight's weapon, there are no bonuses to fighting with axes for the Dark Angels. They only get a bonus to fighting with swords. So against another weapon skill 6 character, instead of hitting them on 3s in the assault with their half weapon skill bonus they get, uh, from their Legion uh, traits, which means if you fight with a sword and you fight someone with the same weapon skill, you get plus one to your to hit roll. He won't get that. So he's going to be no better at fighting a challenge against a Praetor than, well, <laughs> the other Praetor is going to be against him. That's a big problem for a special character that costs this many points, because this is basically the same amount of points that other Praetors will be coming into the fight with. And unlike this guy, they're going to have Paragon Blades, which... Uh, AP2 and initiative, and uh, instant death, which is um, they're going to be fighting first and potentially instant killing you. Because, as you can see from the special rules, he's not Eternal Warrior. He also has Frag Crack and Rag Grenades, Melter Bombs, three Phosphex Bombs, which is interesting. With the Ballistic Skill 6, that's not bad. Not too likely to scatter back onto him. Uh, and of course, the Dreadbringer's Plate is his armor. Special rules, Legion is Astartes Dark Angels, of course. He has the Scion of the Deathwing, oh, sorry, the uh, Dreadwing, big mistake there. Um, Master of the Legion, which means he can use a Rite of War and take a Command Squad. An independent character, Master of the Arsenal, and Warlord. If he's the army's Warlord, then they automatically have the Master of Destruction trait. Alright, so the Dreadbringer Plate doesn't actually say what type of armor it is. It doesn't say, even in its fluff section, whether it's power armor or terminator armor. It says it's an artificer, a suit of artificer plate. Well, terminator armor can be artificer plated as well. But you can infer that it's power armor from the fact that... Um, he has frag and crack grenades. Artificer is generally more associated with um, power armor, but it should still outright say it as a general rule, just so people understand. Generally, that's what you want to do. Um, that's important because certain armor types have certain rules. Because this doesn't have any armor type attached to it, you couldn't actually put him in a Kestis Assault Ram because it specifies, you know, we're getting into the niches here, but it specifies you need to have either Terminator armor or Power armor. Technically, he has neither of those things. Therefore, he cannot go into that vehicle. Just a, a minor note. Uh, it gives him a 2 plus armor save and a 4 plus invulnerable save. So essentially, Artipsa armor and an Iron Halo. In addition, against any weapon with the Crawling Fire or Melter special rules, the invulnerable save is increased to 2 plus, which is pretty strong. Any weapon with the poison special rule can only wound him on a 6 plus. Yeah, it's not not bad. Not bad. It's a good set of armor. Again, it just needs 
to be stated outright, is a set of power armor. It just needs to be added in there somewhere. Uh, Rules Writing 101, you want to make things as black and white as possible so it's not open to interpretation. Although Heresy is not a competitive meta, generally, at least not in my country, I know it's a little bit more competitive in Europe, a lot more competitive, people can start to argue the finer points with you. Master of the Arsenal. What this special rule boils down to is he gets a choice between three different weapons as his sidearm for the game, and you pick which one it is. So, Neural Shredder Carbine, the Magaron Pattern Atomantic Pulse Pistol, and the Selenite Shard Bolt Pistol. Only one of these weapons is really good. The others are interesting, but underwhelming. So, first, the Neural Shredder Carbine. Its range is 18 inches, which is decent. Strength is only 1. But its armor P, a penetration value, the AP, is 2, which is pretty good. It's Assault 2, so 2 shots. That's not bad. Poison 4 plus ignores cover pinning. Yeah, it'll be able to kill enemies that are not uh, in cover. Oh, sorry, that are in cover. That's not a problem. Uh, it's pinning. Mm. Hard to pull off in Heresy, there's a lot of immune to pinning or rerolls to pinning, but okay, it might work for you. The thing is, this is not a shooting character. This is a Praetor. That means you generally want to get him into close combat and be making the most of it. And to get him into close combat, you don't want to go clipping away the units near you, reducing them in numbers. Another big problem is against armies like uh, the Death Guard, for instance. The Poison 4 Plus is going to just be helping them out because they're going to be getting the Feel No Pain and such. Oddly enough, it's a weapon that's better against Loyalists like the Iron Hands who have that increased toughness or resilience against uh, weapons count their strength as one lower than it ordinarily is. That kind of thing. Um, so none of those things are great about it. Now, immediately you can discount this as a viable weapon, really, down to the fact that it is not a pistol, therefore you won't get plus one attack. So do you want to go into combat with this character with only four attacks, with a power axe? Not really. That's it's one more than a standard squad sergeant with a power axe. Not ideal. And you're paying 200 points for it. So that's immediately something I would discount. The Neural Shredder Carbine is not a practical weapon to take on this character. If it brought something else to the table, maybe, but being AP2 on its own is not enough. So next up, the Magaron Pattern Adamantic Pulse Pistol. Range is only 6 inches, so very short ranged. Strength 8, which means it will instant kill Marines. That's important. Uh, especially for things like Terminators or Two Wound Terminators. So if you're close enough to fire this, chances are you're going to make a charge, which means it's okay to kill one enemy with it. And if you're going up against something like Death Shroud Terminators, Segment Terminators, maybe even luckily snipe off an in enemy character, you know, six to hit, you can even single them out. Yeah, that is worth firing at them, because it's not going to reduce the chance of you making a successful charge. Whereas, say, the Neural Shredder Carbine with its 18-inch range is going to tempt you into making those shots at 8, 9, and 10 inches at an enemy. And if they die, then you could be making a charge that might be 9, 10, or 12 inches, uh, which is not great. In fact, it's pretty much impossible. AP2. Okay, they're probably not going to get a save against it. So, already, it's as efficient at killing as the Neural Shredder Carbine. At least this can instant kill. It is a pistol, so you're going to get plus one attacks. That's good. Uh, it has the Lance special rule, so you're going to reduce armor values down to 12, which means you'll glance any vehicle on a 4, or penetrate any vehicle on a 5, the exception being something like the Wham Raider Achilles, which has uh, immunity to things like Lance weapons. Uh, this is going to be very good in armored Ceramite heavy meta, which is what a lot of the tank armies rock a lot of on... Um, Sikarans, Land Raiders, even on Leviathan Dreadnoughts, although I don't recommend it. Um, so that's a thing. And the Shock Pulse, if you do manage to get a shot through a tank, then that tank will not be able to shoot at all next turn. So very good if you get up close and personal with something like a super heavy tank, 
and you can get a shot into it with this, you might reduce all of those guns to the sum naught of zero. So, very good pistol. Short ranged, yes, but uh, it syncs up nicely with a lot of his abilities. And I would also add to that, his Master of Destruction Warlord trait grants him Tank Hunters and Wrecker with all of his shooting attacks. And he also confers that to the heavy weapon shooting attacks of any unit he joins. It's a bit of a bizarre one because the only units he might be joining, like you could join the Terminators for instance, is it worth having Tank Hunter on Heavy Flamers or Wreck Wrecker on Heavy Flamers? No, so that's pointless. Uh, on a Reaper Auto Cannon? Yeah, maybe, but you're only really good at Rhino popping with that. Um, strength 7, 4 shots to be linked out of the squad, not ideal with Wrecker. Um, what about Plasma Blast Gun? Well, yeah, in a pinch maybe, but again, it's only a Rhino Wrecker. So, he won't add much to a Terminator unit. Maybe if you attach him to a veteran squad, maybe that veteran squad has got a uh, missile launcher, a pair of missile launchers on our suspensor webs in it. Yeah, that could be viable, possibly. That's not great. He's the sort of character who would work really well with something that has a lot of DACA. Like, maybe you don't get him into assault at all, and you use him to buff... Um, you would use him to buff something like your... Um, maybe a Devastator squads at the rear of the battlefield, armed with laser cannons or missile launchers. But then for 120 points, I think, you could you could get a um, Siege Master, the uh, Siege Console, and attach them to the unit. And you've saved a heap of points. And they do the same job, and it's not putting all of his other abilities to waste sitting at the back of the battlefield. So, yeah, it's something to think about. But at least the the ward trait, Tank Hunters and Wreckers, syncs up really well with something that's strength at AP2 with Lance and Shock Pulse. Because the chances of getting that penetrating roll go up exponentially with the ability to, you know, well, actually, it doubles. It doubles your chance, essentially. Um, four plus to Glance. 5 plus to pen any vehicle um, with re-rolling your to pen roll thanks to the tank hunters slash wrecker. That is a really good combo with the Adamantic Pulse Pistol. It does not combo at all with the Neural Shredder, which is strength 1. Uh, and the next weapon, the Shard Bolt Pistol, which is only strength 4. And yeah, it does have rending, but that means you're going to get up to, what, strength 10 on your rending roll plus D3. Best case, you can get it to 13. On your shard bolt pistol. Eh, not ideal. Speaking of the shard bolt pistol, range 12, AP 5. It's a four shot pistol with moon silver. Any wound that this does against a demon, demon of the ruin storm or psyker, counts as two wounds. You know, against anything that doesn't have eternal warrior, you're almost always going to be better off taking the adamantic pulse pistol because although it's half the range, if it hits something like a Sekhmet Terminator, you're not relying on their 2 plus armor save to stop it, you're making them use their invulnerable save to stop it, and unlike it doing just 2 wounds to a character or such, it will outright kill a toughness 4 character, which is superior. The only time this might come in handy is if you're going up against a uh, powerful demon of the Ruin Storm, like a Demon Lord, or a Demon Behemoth, but these things are Toughness 7, Toughness 8, like, you can't even hurt Toughness 8 with a Strength 4 weapon. So it's useless against them. So, the Shard Bolt Pistol fails in its intended purpose, because the only demons it's any good on are the weak ones, and the weak ones you'd rather just shoot with an Adamantic Pulse Pistol, because, well, it's more reliable, more likely to hit, more likely to wound, and it's going to instant kill. In theory, if all of the shots hit, because they're going to hit on twos, and, and you get a re-roll of those twos on a six, because he's blissy skill six for some reason. If all of them hit, all of them wound, and it's on lesser demons or something, and they fail every single armor save because they're not near a portal and they don't get a re-roll, okay, potentially it could pay off for you. But a lot of things are falling into place there. And I wouldn't like to bet my money on it when I can go with an adamantic pulse pistol, which is going to be consistent. 
or far more consistent, I think, more of the time, especially later in game when the stuff that starts out toughness 5, toughness 6, is coming down to like toughness 4, toughness 3, and you can just instant kill them with a shot from the pistol. That seems way handier to me as a general rule. Um, the only other thing the shard bolt pistol has going for it is at least it's a bolt pistol, so you will get plus one attack. Uh, lastly, sign of the Dreadwing. Farrath, Red Loss, and any entry unit he joins with um, the Dark Angel special rule may choose to move four inches through difficult terrain rather than rolling any dice and may re-roll failed dangerous terrain tests. So he has a rule that says, I can move through dangerous terrain easier, and I can move through difficult terrain easier. Coupled with a Warlord trait, which buffs heavy weapons, which you ideally don't want to move. Now, you see what I mean about rules writing it. Sometimes people just get it wrong. Because these are contradictory goals. This is either a character who's trying to do a bit of everything, but not well. Or you make a character that does something very well. This is one of those characters who's trying to do a lot of things. He wants to, uh, he wants to be strong in close combat. He's got this armor save, which uh, is, is incredible. 2+, plus, 4+, plus, uh, sort of immunity to crawling fire or melting. You know, like this is the sort of guy that's going to be pretty safe from getting shot at by the enemy with some of those nastier weapons. And, you know, he's a Dark Angel. He's got a high weapon skill. He's got a decent amount of attacks. He has a underwhelming weapon. But he's clearly someone who's strong in close combat. Praetors generally is a rule up. But then any buffs he might get to take him above the average Praetor or be even on par, really, because when it comes down to a one-on-one -on -one fight, if I was this guy, I'd be terrified of power fist armed characters or um, even just Paragon Blade armed characters. Just regular Praetor with Paragon Blade and Iron Halo is going to be terrifying. If they've got digital lasers, you could be looking at guys with 6-7 attacks coming up against you who are just as likely to hit you and more likely to instant kill you, and they're going to do all their attacks before you even get a chance to attack them back. None of that's ideal. Your character is good at that, but then he comes along and he's like, okay, I want to buff my army with my warlord trait and my special rules and my weapons. And it's like, all his weapons are close range, so he needs to get up in their face to use them. But you know if he gets too close, he's going to probably lose the assault against other Praetors. So, and he can't. He doesn't have the sort of weapons that can fight monstrous creatures. Um, he does have rad grenades, which is a start, but uh, and phosphex bombs. But I wouldn't put my money on it. He then gets up close to them to try and fire his neural shredder carbine, his adamantic pulse pistol, or his shard bolt pistol. Okay, but then he's not making use of his master of destruction, which gives tank hunters and wreckers to his attacks and all of the unit he joins attacks. And if the unit he's joining is moving up close with him to get into into close combat and such, well, then they're not getting the benefit of his warlord trait either. So, you see, there's a lot of things here that don't mesh with one another. So I would call this a poorly written character, and hopefully I've explained why. All right, so let's move on now, more positively, somewhat, to Holguin. Master of the Deathwing, Seneschal of the Order of the Forest Cause, and Bulwark of the Legion. 200 point character, so same points as above. Uh, the same points, but loses a point of ballistic skill. In this case, his infantry character has the Deathbringer Aegis, the Viridian Blade, a Volkite Charger, and digital lasers. His special rules are interesting. He has the Scion of the Deathwing, the Master of the Legion, so again, can take a uh, Ward trait, can also take um, a Command Squad. His independent character, as you'd expect, has a rule called Grim Resolve, and if he's a warlord, he has the Child of Terror trait, which is, uh, I believe, reroll to hit in challenges. It's a pretty good one. It's a pretty good one. It's the one that people usually take on Fulgrim if they're going to kid him out to go dueling and killing all the other characters. So, let's look at these special rules. So here, unlike the last one, you can see it clearly says what kind of armor he's in. So already this is a step up. So he's in Cataphracty Pattern Terminator armor. So he's actually, um, in addition, the control player may reroll all feel no pain rolls made from model equipped with the Deathbringer's Aegis. Does he have feel no pain? 
No. Does it pop up later? Yes. In the Grim Resolve special rule. When reduced to two or fewer wounds, Hogwim gains the Feel No Pain special rule. When reduced to his last wound, he gains four Feel No Pain 4 plus instead. Uh, he'd be good when joined by an Apothecary. Say that. Uh, because you'll be getting the most out of the Deathbringer's Aegis from the start. However, if he's taking wounds from the start, that's usually a bad sign. You don't want him just sitting out front trying to tank everything that comes in. A 2+, plus, 5+, plus re-rollable is handy, but still, you don't want to be in that situation. He's in Cataphractic Terminator armor, so he actually should be have the special rule bulky added in here somewhere. Uh, because he's going to take up two slots because of that Cataphractic Terminator armor. He's also going to be basically slow and purposeful. So no running with his unit, no overwatch with his unit, that kind of thing. Important details that people should know. At least having the Cataphractic Pattern Terminator written there clues you in a bit on it. His weapon, the Viridian Blade, as I said before, plus two strength, AP two, melee two-handed, Mastercraft, a Reaping Blow. It's underwhelming, to say the least. Um, it's a slightly worse version of the Death Guard Power Scythe. Slightly worse, slightly better. I'll go slightly better, actually. Yeah, it's, it's an extra point of strength over it, so I'll say slightly better. Strength plus 2 is good. AP 2 is good, but it's two-handed, so it means he's only getting four attacks, five on the charge. Uh, does he have a grenade harness? No. Oh, he does have digital lasers, sorry, so he will have five attacks. Apologies. Unless they've already added it into his profile, they don't say. Again, a person could argue that since it's already listed here, it's already been added into the profile, therefore he only has four attacks. Important to note, digital lasers already included in profile or not already included in profile should be noted next to the war gear. So five attacks. He has no grenade harness. So if he charges an enemy, he's in cataphractic armor, potentially he won't get a charge bonus because he'll count as a disordered charge, things like that. Important things to know because it changes how he plays. He'll be fighting at the same time as other Praetors, but the other Praetors have an edge over him in that, again, they're going to have Paragon Blades. So, he at least has a sword. He'll hit them on threes, they'll hit him on fours. He'll wound them on twos, they'll wound him on threes, but if they roll any sixes to wound, if he fails the armor save against those, he doesn't get his special feel no pain, he just dies. Now, if he has too many enemies attacking him in assault, he maybe he'll want to use that Reaping Blow special rule, so he'll drop his initiative by one and try and take a big swing and kill as many of the enemy units as he can with it. Maybe against something like Demons of the Ruin Storm, that could be handy if you're just trying to cut down chaff and numbers. Um, but generally, I would not call this a viable duelist, despite the fact that he's a um, character of the Death Wing. I will note as well, the Child of Terror is reroll fail to wounds away one to him and any unit he joins. I just remembered, sorry. Um, what got me thinking about it is I'm looking at the Sign of the Deathwing rule, which is he may reroll the first fail to hit uh, roll of any phase while engaged in a challenge. This is in addition to any rerolls made for Master Crafted. So potentially two rerolls to hit. I mean, he's not a bad duelist by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, if he's with uh, Deathwing Knights or something, he'll be increasing their ability to slaughter what they touch, which is already very high. Uh, he'll be increasing that exponentially. So, okay. Very, very strong. It's a complete Death Star. The thing is, between a 10-man unit of Deathwing Knights uh, combined with a... I'm oh, sorry, the Knight Cenobium, combined with a Primus Medicaid, because you're going to get a lot of Daka fired at you. I'll tell you that right now. This is this is crazy. You, the only transport that's going to really take this is a Spartan, because 10 of those plus this guy is 22 slots out of Primus Medicaid. It's 24 slots of your Spartan right there out of uh, 25. When this unit hops out of their transport, if their transport even makes it across the table, everything is going to fire at this unit because it's a Death Star. You're talking a unit that might all be armed with Thunder Hammers and uh, Tyrannic Greatswords. They'll be getting rerolls to wound of a one. 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, fuck that unit. No one's going to want to touch that. And also, the poor Dark Angels players aren't going to think. They're going to take it because it's really cool, and they like the idea of this Death Star. Maybe even if putting the Lion in there instead. They'll take this unit, and then it's going to cost them a 1,000 points by the time they've paid for the unit, paid for the Spartan, maybe even more, maybe 1,200, 1,250, uh, including the characters. And then they're all going to get shot off the table in a turn. <laughs> that's what's going to happen. Is anything that's strength 8 or more, like... Uh, Sikorin, Omega, uh, not Omega, sorry, the uh, Arcus, things like that are going to look at this unit and they're going to be like that meme of the guy licking his lips, uh, rubbing his hands together. That's that's what's going to happen. So, at least this guy is designed to do his job. He's tanky, yes. Uh, he is decent in combat. I still think... The appropriate legion, like say World Eaters or Blood Angels, Praetors with a Paragon Blade, are scarier. Maybe even just the Blade of Salty Tears of the Blood Angels is probably scarier than this Viridian Blade. His special rules don't really add anything to the army as a whole. It's only going to buff the one unit he's with. And the one unit he's with is probably going to be a blender anyway. So... In theory, maybe you won't put him with uh, Deathwing Knight, Cenobium. Maybe you'll put him with um, some of your other power armored veteran type units. But the thing is, he's kind of fracty armored. So he's going to be slowing them down, dragging them down. They can't use rhinos, drop pods, that kind of thing. Not helpful. Plus, you really want to get a Primus Medicae in there. Uh, he's definitely the better of the two characters. Definitely better. Would I take this character in a Dark Angels army? Probably not. I'm not huge on taking special characters in general. Um, I like to make my own characters and tell my own story. But even so, this is a very expensive character who probably, if he was 160 points, I'd be like, oh, definitely viable, very viable. 40 points can be a huge difference in this game. 200 points and the stuff you can get for 200 points, like... He's not much cheaper than uh, someone like Constantine Veldor, who's only like 45 points, something like that more, and Veldor would wipe the floor with this guy. So, take it how you will. Anyway, that is these characters. Ferreth Redwoss, Master of the Dreadwing, and Holdwin, Master of the Deathwing. Redwoss is... He's a case in point of bad rules writing, the what not to do, and, and I really hope I've explained why, how every aspect of what he's armed and armoured with contradicts his special rules and, and makes his play style completely eclectic. He's not great at any one thing and not so uh, generous towards multiple things that he's worth taking for some sort of versatility. It doesn't work that way. Either versatile or specialised. This is neither. This is so under-specialized that it's pointless and not versatile enough to be truly versatile enough to just include for the sake of it. Um, again, something like a Siege Breaker console is going to do most of what he does for your army without costing a Warlord trait and without costing 200 bloody points. It'll be costing like 120 points, which is very acceptable. Um, you can almost get two of them for the cost of this guy. And they'll also give the ability that if you have any um, Medusas, Basilisks, Thud Guns, you can give them Phosphix Rounds, which makes them way better, um, which is something that this guy can't do either. So I'm Mac with the Outer Circle. Thank you all for watching this episode, and see you all next time.